Hello and welcome to the World Soccer Talk podcast, your weekly dose of talking about watching soccer on TV, online, and apps. Coming up on episode fifty-six, we feature an exclusive interview with Kyle Martino about his race to become president of U.S. Soccer. Plus, we have news about a leading English commentator who will be leaving the U.S. to return to the U.K. and all of the latest TV ratings and our thoughts and opinions about the coverage of the League Cup and FA Cup on U.S. TV. Plus, we have letters from you, the listeners, in our mailbag section. My name is Christopher Harris, aka the Gaffer, and I'm joined today by Kartik Krishnaya. Now, Kartik, uh, it's been a hurly burly seven days of, I mean, tons of football. Uh, unfortunately, I know I know some circumstances came up that you didn't get a chance to watch as much football this past week as you normally do. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, a bunch of things. First of all, uh, I had family in town for the holidays. They left their flight, leaving Fort Lauderdale back to Chicago was right during LFC Everton, so uh, didn't get to watch that except for snippets. Uh, although I have to say I, I was um, uh, impressed in the snippets I watched of Liverpool's tenacity in that match. Uh, and, and, and we'll want to point out that I really enjoyed the pregame show. This shows, uh, and this is, this seems like beating a dead horse for us, Chris. This shows when Kate Abdohos versus Rob Stone, she, she pushes the right buttons, asks the right questions to get the best out of the talent Fox has. So she asks Alexi Lala some very pointed questions about Liverpool, about Mo Salah, about Philippe Coutinho, uh, and, uh, Lala's, rose to the occasion and gave the kind of concise uh, cutting edge analysis that he typically doesn't give. And you know, maybe, maybe he he's more studied or read up or more uh, interested in Liverpool than he is in, in some uh, CONCACAF country, the U S is playing. Maybe, maybe that's it. Right. Uh, but he gave very good analysis, the level of analysis we get from Musto and, uh, and Martino and, and Earl on it. See, uh, Warren Barton didn't give that level of analysis, but, right. I, but but Wallace was very good. And I'm thinking to myself, is this Kate Abdo or is this um, just that Lawless he, he knows Liverpool better than he knows uh, the teams he play in CONCACAF? I think uh, I think it's mostly Kate Abdo. I mean, she's definitely got some fantastic uh, on-screen chemistry. Um, you mean kind of with, with Warren too, and, and Alexi, and whoever's on the set. She's really, really good in that spot. And uh, I mean, Alexi, I, I know has been commentating Liverpool games quite a few times uh, the past few years, uh, doing Europa League, and I mean, of course, FA Cup games now and again. But I think it's really more Kate Abdo uh, asking those those questions, knowing that. Um, Alexi, for the most part, is very opinionated and will give some good good responses. But I must say, Carter, I'm going to interject here too, is that other than Kate Abdo, I thought that uh, Fox's coverage of the FA Cup this past weekend is old and tired. It's 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 the, the, the mailing it in in terms of the production values. Um, this really looks like I mean Fox is I mean so formulaic and pr- predictable in terms of the way that they set up the FA Cup. Uh, we talked about this last week and we said okay we know what's going to happen and here's a prediction and, and exactly that happened in terms of the intro and the montage etc. But I, I don't think Fox has changed any any way that they cover the FA Cup in about four or five years. I mean, the graphics are the same since 2015. It's been, even with, with the sp- swirling globe, uh, the maps that these come in on, it's for, I mean, Crystal Palace against Brighton and showing you where they are on the, on the map of the UK, etc. So from the production point of view, it's old and tired and just very blasé, um, really mailing it in. Uh, but, but yeah, Kate Abdo was uh, a rare shining light in a really, to me, dismal FA Cup um, weekend, both on the pitch and off the pitch. Except for, <laughs> except for Nottingham Forest Arsenal, but we'll get into that in a minute. I'm going to disagree with you slightly, Chris, but only slightly. I, I think the on-air talent for Fox, the little bits I saw this weekend, were better. I thought Stu Holden was pretty good in the studio, whichever day he was in. I think it was after the Fleetwood Town game, uh, because that was the game I saw on Saturday. Uh, I felt like Barton was okay. It was passable. Kate Abdo was really good. I talked about Lawless being very good on Friday. I completely agree with you, and unfortunately, this obscures the on-air talent, is the production. And this is part of the issue with Fox when we go after Fox. Uh, Time and again, it's the 
graphics. It's the laziness of the production. It's the laziness of the narrative and the montage. It's the loudness of the montage at times. It's the uh, level production and low effort and, and little thought process that into the presentation, which has nothing to do with the on-air talent. It has to do with the production team general commitment from the network to this product. Now, I am told, uh, and I'm now, uh, now that I'm watching more college basketball this season than I have the last few seasons, even though that's my second love as a sport behind uh, soccer, a distance act, my second love, I've watched some games on FS1 this year in college basketball, and it's equally Rob Stone, by the way, is the studio host for college basketball uh, on Fox also. But uh, equally lazy, equally um, forced, uh, the level of the, of the on-air talent isn't as good, with, uh, with one or two exceptions as ESPN, who all covers uh, that sport but covers different conferences, just like they cover different leagues in, in international football. So I think it's really a, a Fox thing. And look, uh, Chris, I think bottom line is the, the ratings for FS1 and FS2 by comparison to ESPN and ESPN2 are significantly lower for any sporting event. Maybe maybe Fox as a network has mailed it in to a certain extent on really producing things at a top level, which has to have us a little concerned for the World Cup. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think I think they'll be okay for the World Cup. I think they're putting all of their eggs in that one basket, and and probably focusing a lot of the, the time. And also, David Neal, the executive producer, really focusing in on that. While uh, whoever the producer is for the FA Cup and Champions League, it's just they're just going through the motions and just doing the bare minimum just to get this. Uh, I mean, this coverage out there. But but it, there was a couple other things too, Kartik, in, in this weekend of FA Cup uh, coverage. One was the Liverpool Everton match that you mentioned already. But uh, was even just pre-match. Uh, they came back and uh, they had "You'll Never Walk Alone" booming out, and they talked all over it. I mean, they just talked for about two or three minutes, just talking about, I mean, not, nothing, nothing exception, exceptional, and had an opportunity there at, at, at that point if they wanted to, just to just be quiet and just let the the anthem do the talking, and then go in, right into the match. Oh, was, um, one other point from that pregame show, though, I, I, I liked, I appreciated Lawless's analysis of Virgil Van Dyke and how he can become an elite world class defender. Now, again, uh, there are people who defend Warren Barton who say he gives those sorts of uh, those sorts of uh, um, analysis about the. Also, I didn't hear it on this show, but I do. I. I come to appreciate Chris that you do have two defenders in the studio when those two guys are working together I might get some analysis about the actual positioning and tactics of playing central defense or uh, a fullback position that you don't want other programs and I, and I actually appreciated Lawless's discussion of Van Dyke as a improve Liverpool, particularly in one-on-one situations where their central defenders like other central defenders we know have been terrible over the course of the last few years yeah, I don't know. For me, for me, it was uh, pretty common sense um, analysis. There wasn't anything that Lala said that was uh, just incredible insight or analysis that that the average viewer wouldn't be able to see for themselves. But but that, that's just me. Now, now the, the, to, to, it was, I guess Fox had a bad, bad weekend anyway, just because the FA Cup matches were dismal. <laughs> I mean, really, really bad. Starting with Saturday with the Fleetwood Town Leicester game, that was a nil nil. Um, and then I, I skipped the 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock games, which I should have watched the Man City Burnley game, but, um, and just followed the, the Wolves against Swansea on the, the Swansea City app and listened to the radio commentary. I uh, came back for the Norwich Chelsea game, a, a dire game. I mean, this is a, a nil nil game, but I mean, Chelsea just didn't seem to try it at all in this one. But at the end of the game, you had Kate Abdo, Warren Barton, and Stuart Holden. And at the end of the game, they were joking about the romance of the cup and isn't this great and another action packed day of FA Cup coverage. And I'm like, I'm sure that's probably whether it's a teleprompter or whether it's uh, Fox telling them to say that. But again, just another example of just how inauthentic this coverage is from Fox and where they just can't be real and just say, all right, this was a dud of a game. You know, let's, let's move on and hope that maybe Sunday would be better. And, and Sunday was a little bit better. Uh, the Shrewsbury West Ham game to me was like a 
like, like a rugby match. So many bleeding heads, uh, like really tough tackles, broken teeth. Uh, so not <laughs> another nil. Well, I think it was nil-nil tie in that one too. Yeah. And then of course, then the Nottingham Forest Arsenal game, the one game this whole, whole entire weekend that, uh, was a bit of a, a savior in terms of, uh, having a shining light on something positive from this FA Cup weekend. And that was a really entertaining, competitive, uh, open-ended match. And, uh, yeah, that, that, that was a great one to watch. Yeah. So Saturday I, I watched Fleetwood town and, and Leicester in the morning. And then, uh, unfortunately because of some family issues, having to foster two cats, which, uh, uh, some family members were ready to give up to the, to the shelter or throw out on the street. Uh, missed the Man City game, missed the uh, Chelsea game after that. And uh, the FA Cup, now I love the competition, I love the romance of the Cup, but I don't have it set on my DVR uh, to tape every game like I do. Any uh, Premier League game on any NBC network or any Bundesliga on any Fox network automatically uh, uh, DVRs because I want to go back and those, but I don't do that with the FA Cup because it'll take up a lot of space and I might end up deleting most of the games anyway, which it sounds like would have been the case this weekend without watching them. Uh, so Sunday, my wife is leaving for two months, uh, Schwartz and state government to go to our state capital in Tallahassee. I missed the first half getting her ready to go and out. Um, missed the first half of the Arsenal Forest game, uh, but did tape that game. That was the one game I had actually physically like man at the DVR because I had it given Arsenal's uh, recent performances in the league, but then also the, the fact that they're the holders and they've won three of the last four FA Cups thought it might be intriguing. So I did get to watch that. I enjoyed it. I love seeing Eric Lehigh, a player that Durbin Klinsman never seemed to rate for the U S and, and uh, would, would find ways not to call them up. We call a random right backs from here and there. And uh, MLS guy has a, a couple good matches and he gets called up ahead of Lehigh of uh, Lehigh uh, score that first goal, which was great. But the goal, the technique, the, uh, the positioning sense the, the when he made that run, uh, just perfect. The sort of play we don't see from American players very often in European football. Yes, it was a uh, one-off game in, in the FA Cup, and it was a magical night. But Lehigh's been doing that for years. Uh, play this year is, is, hasn't been as, as good as it was in the past, but uh, when it was at the apex of his career, Klinsman refused to call him into the national team. So in the wake of everything that's happened in U.S. soccer, that's kind of a bitter thing, bitter pill for me to swallow. And then uh, Monday, I know, I know you were going to want to talk about Monday, uh, Brighton and Palace, I had the ready to go and watch and my dog uh who's very old ended up uh, having a, a medical issue i had to take him to uh the, the vet thankfully he's okay but uh i missed that match i was really looking forward to that match because that's a match between two really, um old uh, uh rivals you, you need to have family in kent i i had family that lived in kent for a while that um to understand how big that derby is now uh, in unfortunately, well, unfortunately or fortunately, they're in the same division this season, so it, it has less of a less of a, a big feel. There were times they would play in the FA Cup and they'd be two divisions apart. And- yeah, Kartik, this one was an interesting one for me. I mean, you had John Champion and Efren Okoku commentating. Uh, Efren, we don't get to hear that often, but uh, always enjoy his commentary. But this was the, uh, interesting for this match. Um, it was pretty entertaining, not the most entertaining match, but it was the first time that VAR had been used in the UK for a competitive uh, club soccer match. And the implementation of this one is seems to be a little bit different than than what we've seen in the Bundesliga and Major League Soccer. Uh, now, I don't know if it's just early days and just the referees are getting used to the system, but this one is, um, and we saw it again too in the Arsenal Chelsea match. But um, this one is a bit interesting in that there was some, there was an incident in the Brighton uh, Crystal Palace game where there was a goal towards the end of the match from uh, Glenn Murray, and there was a question about whether or not he handled the ball. Now, the video replay that we saw on television clearly showed that there was no handball, but for the referee on the pitch and his assistance, as well as the players, uh, we expected at that point then for the referee to go to video review and kind of do the the big square or the big rectangle motion and just 
so that the viewer and those at the stadium would know that we'd be going back to, I think, Uxbridge is where, where the studio is, and they, they would look at the tape and go, come back to, I think, Martin Atkinson with, with the actual uh, ruling on this one. Oh, whoever, whoever the referee was, actually it was a different referee, uh, was on, on this instance. But there was none of that. There was definitely communication between the referee and um, the video assistant referee. But we didn't, we, we're not able to hear that conversation. We're not able to see what happened or what transpired, what the discussion was. And the goal stood, which, which was the right call in the end. But a lot of confusion about whether or not video assistant referee was used, which we believe it was, or not. And, and again, we saw that in the, the midweek uh, League Cup game too with Arsenal Chelsea with uh, referee Martin Atkinson using the headset quite often and definitely communicating what we believe with the uh, video assistant referee. Uh, um, I guess. I, I don't know. I, I mean, I we're thought, not sure, right? Yeah, because I thought the call was pretty obvious. About Maitland Niles was clearly fouled. I, I don't think there can be any question about it. Chelsea fans, I know you'll send in your hate mail and, and whatever. I thought that that was clear as they come. So I don't think he consulted with the, with the VAR. I mean, how could he not? I, or if you're a referee, Chris, and you're in Atkinson's position in that Chelsea Arsenal match, don't you at least want to see it again for yourself from a, a, a different angle? And make sure you got it right. Yeah. Well, I guess that's that's the difference so far with the the English style that they've used it, and it's only been like what for like what two matches or three matches is it's been all through the radio headset. There's been no like running up to the side of the pitch, looking at the screen and going, okay, well, let me, let me take a look at this. Uh, so maybe that's I, partly just the referees kind of being conscious of trying to not take a lot of time on these decisions and just trying to make sure there's no break in the game perhaps. Yeah, I have to admit, I mean, a lot of our listeners, as we got lots of feedback a couple of months ago when we threw out this topic, a lot of our listeners are watching the, uh, the Bundesliga. So the Bundesliga has done it to the opposite of where there are constant stoppages now. It, it, I don't want to say it feels like an American sporting event. That's hyperbole. But it's, it's somewhere in between an American sporting event and what we view as traditional football with the number of stoppages they've had and referees looking at things. But... Uh, the Bundesliga, generally, they're getting the calls right after a, a rough early start. This was as, okay, again, Chelsea fans, uh, you may disagree with me. Some dis- I saw on Twitter people were making rationalizations. This is as clear as they come. Clear foul, Moses trips him, Maitland Niles tries to stay on his feet. He can't. He goes down. It's in the area. It's dangerous play. It's reckless play. I mean, maybe it's not dangerous play, but it's reckless play, and it's a foul. It's a penalty. Yeah. And the problem now is Wenger is already serving a three-man touchline ban for um, his com- complaints about calls in the, la- the last time these two sides met a week ago. So, uh, and there's been controversy in the past. Remember the Diego Costa Andre Santos game? Uh, there seems to be now consistently some questionable calls when Chelsea plays Arsenal, and it's just going to further magnify the whole lens on Premier League referees and on, on the Premier League. Now, of course, it's an FA Cup, or sorry, League Cup match, but uh, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. And you have a tool, use it. Yeah, I, I think that's that's the biggest complaint I have is in terms of being very transparent. So like the Bundesliga, you know exactly when there's video assistant uh, review or video assistant referee in place. Because as a TV viewer, it kind of comes up with a box and on the bottom says video assistant referee or video assistant review. And it's it's very blatant. And so far what we've seen in the um, in the FA Cup match and then the, the League Cup matches, it's been, it's been, are they going to it or not? Uh, at the end of the day, Kartik, and we've talked about this in previous episodes, is it's not going to make sure that uh, all calls are going to be correct, but it's going to be more correct calls than, than incorrect calls in the long run. So there will be instances like this one we saw this week uh, in the Arsenal-Chelsea game where, you I mean, perhaps it should have been a penalty. I mean, again, it's debatable, but with the technology in place, this should ensure better decisions but again it comes down to the referee because ultimately that referee might have a different viewpoint than say some of the top referees in, in the business and they might say no actually that referee made, a, made the wrong decision but uh, interesting and hopefully the Premier League will learn from this uh, what's 
I mean, kind of the best way to implement this technology. And then maybe, maybe next season or the season after, we'll, we'll have it in the Premier League. It, it's desperately needed. I think there's a place for it. Uh, it's just the implementation of that. And, and again, it's, it's early days, so hopefully things will work out. The other thing, Kartik, to me is that uh, this past week, and actually I was thinking about that, that this morning, is that um, there's always the debate uh, for soccer viewers about entertainment versus, I mean, for, for the clubs specific, specifically, entertainment versus winning games. Now, the clubs are there really to win games. They're not there to entertain. If they can find a way to have a combination of the two, then that's fantastic. But as we saw with the FA Cup and um, even to the League Cup to a certain extent, uh, not that entertaining, and, and even the Premier League matches over the, um, the holiday period. Yes, they were enthralling, and yes, they meant a lot, but not the most entertaining games. And I did get to watch not the entire match, and I, I'm going to have to go back to it um, the next couple of days. I have it on DVR. But I did watch uh, Real Betis against uh, Sevilla in the Sevilla derby. And that, to me, that one game, the first 15 minutes of that were more entertaining than any of these matches I've seen in this past week. And it makes me wonder, too, in some ways, that um, Major League Soccer has got such a, a mountain to climb because people like you and I and many of the listeners are going to be tuning into these FA Cup matches or League Cup matches or Premier League matches because we, we, we've, we're invested in this, whether it's our clubs, whether it's Manchester City or, in my case, Swansea City or the listeners, whoever you support. I mean, no matter what, what the entertainment level is, whether it's good or bad, these people are going to continue to tune in to watch these matches for the most part for years, if not decades to come. And it's difficult for Major League Soccer to really kind of get in, in on this because to me, I mean, I watch MLS. So I don't watch it as much as some people do, but I don't have a favorite MLS team. I just watch it from, from afar from time to time. Let me follow up on that point. The M MLS may be in incredibly shape on television if La Liga gets a mainstream television contract in this country. I think La Liga continuing to be on BN isolates that product from a, a lot of the American audience who then uh, makes automatic reflexive comparisons between the Premier League and the ML and, and, and Major League Soccer. It's not the MLS, Major League Soccer. And there are some points where MLS stands up decently against the League. But then all of the critiques that that MLS fans make about the Premier League, most of them don't apply to the quality of play or the entertainment level in La Liga. So I think it's, uh, boy, if La Liga, let's say, ends up on uh, uh, maybe, uh, the, well, yeah, let's say it ends up on NBC or ESPN or Turner or someplace, I think that's a huge problem for um, for MLS yep. because there are things about the Premier League that make it clearly more entertaining and more sellable than Major League Soccer even for American audiences those few drawbacks the Premier League have uh, are covered nicely by La Liga mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and one way or another you're going to win basically without watching MLS if you are looking for entertaining quality football at the club level yeah, for, for La Liga, it sl slots, well, actually not, not as nicely as it did in the past, but it, uh, in terms of kind of if NBC had the Premier League and uh, had La Liga, uh, actually nowadays they're, they're pretty close in terms of kickoff times. But there are most of, the, most of the entertaining matches usually are kind of that 2.45 kickoff on, on a Saturday or the 2.45 on, on a Sunday. So it would segue really well with NBC with having the Premier League in the morning and having that 2.30 game, or 12.30 end at 2.30 Eastern time and then have you know, the big La Liga uh, game of the day on. And then you, maybe showing the other La Liga games on NBC uh, Sports Gold or or maybe it's CNBC or maybe it's USA. But there's, there's great potential there. Right. And if you have when you have the classical, the second classical this season is going to start at the more normal time for, yeah. for American audiences. Uh, when you have that, you can put that on big NBC. Oh, my God. That would go. Imagine how much how many views that would have. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You get that on a network in the U.S. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah. So I, I think glad you brought up the the, uh, the, the Sevilla Derby. I'm glad you brought that game up match up because I think that there is a uh, there is a quality level of play. And I have to say, Yes, I'm going to call out American Premier League fans because I've done it time and again on Twitter. There are so many American Premier League fans who never watched La Liga who make the same lazy assumptions about La Liga MLS fans that we always complain MLS fans make about other leagues in Europe. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, it, it, they, they'll always say, oh, there are only two good teams in La Liga and uh, uh, every team in the Premier League is good and 1 through 20. I mean, really, if you watch West Brom play, I don't think West Brom would stay up in La Liga. I know they wouldn't stay up in the Bundesliga. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it, it, 
think, no offense, Chris with Swansea this season. So sure. uh, maybe you should watch a La Liga game that doesn't involve Barcelona and Real Madrid because then they'll also complain, oh, Barcelona wins every game five Watch a Betis Sevilla game. Watch a Valencia Villarreal game. Uh, watch a Tafe game, and you'll see different levels of uh, 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 Levante. It's a team I've actually got kind of liked watching this season when I've gotten to see them. See the quality of the of the of that league, and that it's different than. Premier League. It's not as fast. It's not maybe as uh, end to end, but also you see as many bad giveaways in midfield. I mean, you see more bad giveaways uh, in it, it, you see more bad giveaways in one Premier League game in midfield than you do in an entire uh, match day of of La Liga. So there are things you might appreciate if you watch that league. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so we'll talk about La Liga TV rights in the news section in a little bit. But uh, w- one more thing, Kartik, before we move on to the next segment, and that is that uh, this past week I've been watching uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a series of interviews that's done it's by the Oxford Union. So you, know, you have Cambridge University, you have Oxford University. Well, the Oxford Union, if you, if you uh, look at it up on YouTube, they've got actually a lot of great, fantastic interviews. So about Each one's about an hour long. Uh, everyone, including uh, Ruud van Nisselrooy, uh, Clarence Seedorf, um, Har- Harry Redknapp, Tony Pulis, Chris Coleman, Rio Ferdinand, the list goes on and on. And it's really, I mean, usually the first 15 to 20 minutes or one-on-one interviews uh, by one of the um, students there. But then they open it up for the discussion, and it's usually about you know, 40 minutes of discussion and questions about anything and everything. And it gives it a shining light, and it gives, it gives it really a, a good... Um, a better appreciation, really, of, of people like Clarence Seedorf or Ruud van Nistelrooy, just as two examples. As, uh, people that are very educated, uh, have some great insight into the game and their experiences, and uh, talking about some of the challenges that soccer and sports have in the current days. Uh, so I'd recommend uh, any of the listeners that are looking for some things to kind of fill the void where there's maybe no games on or just some uh, evening entertainment, uh, especially for cord cutters or not. But anyway, Oxford Union uh, some great interviews there. All right, Kartik, let's move on to our next segment, and that is TV streaming news. Yeah, uh, big news this week. I think just about everybody who listens has probably seen it. Soccer will soon be America's third favorite spectator sport. In a Gallup poll that was released this week, we learned that soccer is the first favorite, favorable uh, spectator sport in the United States and close to the passing base. Seven percent of Americans named soccer as their favorite sport to watch. While that may not sound like much to figure represents a significant three percentage point gain from just four years ago. Soccer is a sport to post such a large increase. Uh, We're seeing it all the time. Maybe I was wrong. It's not in each sport. It's becoming a mainstream sport. I I check out at Publix Sports Illustrated for Kids is in the checkout line. There is a... Yeah, Kartik, you're breaking up a little bit there. But, uh, yeah, so just to uh, paraphrase, so um, soccer is the fourth most favorite sex, uh, spectator sport in the U.S., according to this poll, uh, beating out uh, ice hockey. And it's closing in on baseball. So, um, yeah, I still think that soccer is not a niche sport. It's still growing. But uh, we've had that debate before, and I'm sure we'll have it again. But moving on to the next news segment uh, or item, and that is that La Liga has launched its latest tender for overseas rights. Now, they've launched the bidding process for TV rights to the Spanish League in Europe, Asia, and Oceania. Bids will be accepted through till uh, February the 5th. The rights are for the season spanning 2018 to 19 to the end of the 2021 season, as well as the 2018-19 uh, season to 22 to 23 in Asia and Oceania. Now, the bidding process does not include the U.S. In the U.S., being sports has the rights through until the end of the 2019-20 season. So we've still got a couple years to go. Chances are those, uh, that bidding process will probably start in about a year to a year and a half from now. And like we mentioned before, too, just kind of, uh, kind of, kind of educated guess, but maybe NBC might be interested. And, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of other, um, kind of media companies or streaming companies in the United States that would be interested in La Liga. So, so stay tuned. Yeah, uh, Al- Alan Green has stepped down from Atlanta United. Alan Green will not be returning as Atlanta's lead commentator this season. Out of Atlanta's 34 MLS matches this season, Fox and ESPN broadcasting 20 of those games. So that's the majority of them, which would leave Green with just 14 
pronounced for local Atlanta TV over the span of eight months. So that's a little less than two games a month. Uh, Green decided to take a pass and return to BBC Radio 5 Live in the UK. Uh, I had also been told that he was actually, when he he was in the US, living on the West Coast. So he was still commuting into Atlanta. I don't know if that's true or not, but... um, um, it's a, it's a shame in a way a great voice, but uh, uh, Atlanta has been such a big success that uh, if you're Fox and ESPN, you're grabbing as many games as you can for national audiences. Yeah, he has family in the San Diego area, so I wouldn't be surprised if he was kind of flying from uh, California to Atlanta um, for these games and then and then going back to spend time with his family. But yeah, it makes sense that um, I mean, when there's only there's less than two games a month to commentate, I mean, is it worth staying here and doing all that traveling and spending all that money? Probably not. Our last item in the news segment uh, is that uh, Fox Sports will be producing a show on Twitter for the World Cup that will be hosted by Rachel Bonetta. The 30-minute live show will be streamed from Moscow's Red Square each match day. Uh, Featured guests on the show will include Rob Stone, Landon Donovan, Kate Abdo, Alexi Lalas, uh, Fernando Fiore, Stuart Holden, and others. Uh, Fox will also uh, provide near live video highlights to Twitter for each game, including every goal scored. So good news there for uh, those of us on Twitter. And last but not least, uh, on Snapchat, uh, Fox Sports will produce a publisher story that chronicles the day-to-day drama of the tournament. So good news for Twitter. Good news for Snapchat. Uh, The one that's missing in this uh, equation is Facebook. And then Facebook is the one that has the the much greater share of uh, not only uh, users, but also active users. But then again, though, too, it's difficult to kind of see. I mean, Twitter is is probably a better place for um, goal highlights than Facebook. I mean, where would you find it on Facebook? Where would you find it? And it's Facebook's still not that type of um, the way it's structured. It's very difficult to find uh, content. Yeah, I I mean, I'm I'm the opposite of everyone else. I only go on Facebook when uh, uh, when. I, I have a reason to go on. I have uh, I have about a thousand friends on Facebook. I have seven thousand followers or more on Twitter. So I, I'm, I'm much more Twitter driven. I don't have Snapchat at all. Maybe I should sign up based on this. But I just think for the sport and for reaching fan audiences and media kind of crisply, uh, Twitter is still the best uh, mechanism. Facebook when I when we've had Facebook lives, like for example the other day the Jacksonville Armada. Uh, I, uh, I I might've even actually broken the story. I'm I'm not sure that they were doing a press conference, the press conference uh, about their future in in leagues with all the confusion in the U S soccer. This was on Saturday. I didn't realize at the time the press conference was actually going to be on Facebook live. When I went to Facebook on Monday to watch the stream of, of owner Robert Palmer's press conference, I couldn't find it. And on the, on the uh, Armada page, I couldn't find it. It's, it's so confusing. And uh, Rachel Panetta has done uh, things for during the champions league on Fox, right? Yep. Uh, on Facebook. And I've had a hard time finding her content uh, on Facebook, even on the Fox soccer page. So I'm glad they're using Twitter as a medium uh, for her content from Russia, uh, quite quite honestly. Maybe that's me. Uh, I know mo- mo- far more people are on Facebook, but uh, I think it'll be easier to find and probably easier for to stream and watch for most people mm-hmm. if, they, if they figure it out and, and give the effort. Yeah, the only downside to me personally is that I'd love to see Rachel Bonetta on television more. I mean, obviously. Well, yeah, I know. No, I, I actually made that observation to someone the other day. Yeah, social media wise, I mean, it's great and she's a perfect fit for that, but I'd love to see him on te- television more, but uh, yeah, maybe, maybe down the road. Uh, well- Chris, uh, before you, you leave that, why why do you think that is? Is is it uh, that Fox is trying to push so much onto social media as they, uh, as they develop uh, their their model uh, for the future? There are more and more cord cutters, or is it that they don't value her? Uh, what she brings to the table? Because uh, again, you know, maybe I'm I'm biased towards. Who I think have a knowledge of this sport, but uh, she's actually impressed me. She impressed me when she was at MLS. She impresses me at Fox with her understanding of uh, of uh, soccer, uh, at least North American soccer, more than anything. I, I don't, I don't quite get it. Why? not used on air do you think it's a well she is used on air but not on air on the channel Mm -hmm. do you think it's uh, part of a a macro long-term strategy to shift everything to digital 
Uh, part, partly. I think, I think part of it is that uh, she just uh, fits the equation really well. So, for example, uh, Fox, uh, Facebook paid Fox to uh, broadcast the Champions League games on Facebook, and she's a perfect person to have in that hosting role that's kind of alive, younger, uh, appeals to the 18 to 34 uh, male demographic, and you know, is a really kind of great on-screen um, presence and is funny at times. So I, so I think for Facebook and for Fox Sports, really, that's a perfect fit. It might be the same, too, with this Twitter deal. It might be that uh, Twitter is paying Fox Sports to um, have the rights to broadcast some of these uh, goal highlights on Twitter. And by doing so, um, uh, creating this show. And so, again, it could be Twitter paying Fox Sports to have Rachel Bonetta doing this show. If you remember, too, probably this is going back about a year ago, uh, Fox FS1 used to do kind of, what was it? Uh, I forgot the name of it, but usually about 30 seconds to a minute, kind of a, a quick video news segment. And it was not, not really news. It was more kind of a, a viral video of the day or some crazy yeah, yeah. thing. And Rachel oftentimes was, was uh, on those. Those I haven't seen in ages. Um, I just think in terms of what their strategy is, which is trying to monetize video, uh, whether it's on the website or whether it's on social media or whether it's having her on television just to make sure that uh, you know, visibility, she fix, fits that perfectly. I, I don't think it's any t- part of a, a long-term strategy. I think it's just more short-term. I mean, she's a perfect for, a person for that. Yeah, it's interesting to see how networks and obviously ESPN and, and, and NBC and everybody else also make this kind of transition from digital or from uh, television on air to digital. All right, so let's move on to TV ratings. Uh, we will have the full list of TV ratings at worldsoccertalk.com uh, probably this weekend. We usually post it on the homepage. But uh, some of the numbers we've got so far, so we've got some FA Cup numbers. Uh, we don't have the League Cup numbers yet. Uh, we do have some Copa del Rey numbers. And uh, so far, uh, the biggest one so far is the Nottingham Forest against Arsenal. Uh, that had uh, 370,000 viewers, and that was on Sunday on FS1. Yeah, the Norwich Chelsea Snooze Fest, uh, sorry Chelsea fans, on uh, Saturday, and that was uh, 333,000 on FS1. Uh, bouncing around a little bit, the Copa uh, del Rey numbers, you had uh, Celta de Vigo against Barcelona, uh, that was on BN Sports and Asp- Espanol, and that was on, uh, I think, last week, last Thursday, that had uh, 238,000. Then you had uh, Numancia against Real Madrid uh, last Thursday, also Copa del Rey, uh, also on BN Sports and Espanol, that had 220,000 viewers. Uh, any other numbers there, Kartik, that, that uh, jump out at you? Uh, no, other than I, I admit that I had watched the uh, Celta Barcelona first leg. And second leg is actually t- t- today. We're recording on Thursday. Listen to this after it's done. But I did watch that first leg. I forgot that was this week. That was Thursday. Yep, yep, that's right, that's right. So uh, not huge numbers. It, it, it's a rare weekend where there's no Premier League matches on. Uh, we will get the Liga MX uh, or Liga MX numbers uh, in this weekend too. And those, uh, of course, Liga MX uh, started back up again on Friday. So that I'm sure some big numbers there. But uh, that's what we have so far. Moving on to list of mail, mailbag. Uh, we've got uh, the first one up is from John Patrick Manning. He sent in this tweet. He says... Um, I enjoy your podcast with Kartik greatly. One inconsistency with your opinions I see is that the Mexican League has great ratings in USA, despite having uh, an almost MLS structure. One, they barely relegate. Um, or they barely relegate anyone, only one team per season, so even a mid-sized club is at no risk. And number two is that they have playoffs. Promotion relegation, ratings-wise, will make little difference. Major League Soccer haters will not tune in uh, to watch A, uh, lousy teams, uh, Colorado, Minnesota, or whatever, hack it out in an empty stadium for a right to stay in Major League Soccer. And then uh, two, no more likely to watch two top table clubs play because there isn't there's promotion relegation i think promotion relegation would have some benefits development wise but it's not a panacea especially for ratings Ronaldo is right fix the calendar and coaching and college if possible the owners won't do promotion relegation anyway fight the more important battles what do you think about this one kartik yeah i uh I, i tend to agree with a lot of this uh 
I have been outspoken for years and people say, uh, my critics say that I'm inconsistent and I'm one day I'm on the NASL side, the next day I'm on the MLS side. No, I just tend to be nuanced and, and pretty pragmatic about the way I view uh, my sympathies are more obviously with the NASL and pro rel side. The one thing I have always maintained is to me, the biggest issue in American professional soccer is the calendar. I think that has to be done and everything else comes after that. So, and all that is absolutely right. I don't even know how you have an effective pro rel system if you're playing on a March to November calendar as these U.S. pro leagues are currently. I think it's very difficult when your windows are completely misaligned with the with the rest of the world, particularly with Europe. I, I hear about Brazil, but Brazil it's different because they're an established nation where their players are a commodity at European clubs anyway. Our American players are not. And, uh, and it's tough to create the – generate the type of player – you have if your calendar is all wrong. I think then you you implement pro rail. You shift the calendar. You start playing on the same calendar with the winter break that European clubs are. Then you implement promotion and relegation, and you have to fix the coaching. So uh, John Patrick Manning, who I interact a lot with on Twitter, has uh, uh, has, has uh, given some very wise suggestions here. Pro rail is important. But it's not the panacea. It is not the be all and end all, fix all. In fact, I think the calendar is more important. I would put that one and Pro Rail too. If if I had a gun to my head and said you could only do one or one or the other. Yeah, he has some good points. Um, I disagree on a couple of things. Like one is that uh, Liga MX has uh, two seasons. They have a split season. You I mean so they have a Apertura and a, a Clausura. So it makes the season shorter. It makes it more competitive uh, for a shorter period of time, rather than Major League Soccer, which would be your March all the way through t- to December, really, and uh, one long long season, uh, no promotion relegation in Major League Soccer. So very little reason to tune in from March until July. You can tune in in August when the playoff race really kind of goes into the final lap. And then you have uh, sporadic games from August through all the way through till end of November and then the final in December. Having it split into two could make a difference. Uh, There's lots of different options. I do agree that it's not the panacea. I do think, though, that uh, promotion relegation would help TV ratings. It would give people a reason to tune in. I mean, otherwise, you mean you can skip it, and do you really miss much? You can watch the, you mean the highlights on YouTube for a couple of minutes, and you're good, and off you go. There's there's very little uh, enticement to really kind of pull you into that match and watch watch it if it's in you know March, April, May, June, or July. All right, Mr. G sent in this tweet as a reply to his comment on last week's pod, and he says, uh, thanks for airing my tweet. Number one, I'd prefer the German promotion relegation model. I love the promotion uh, playoff idea. It could be hyped as a double jeopardy uh, concept for the Major League Soccer teams in the drop zone. Number two, it's a misnomer that all promotion relegation is the same. The general mechanism is the same, but the operation varies from country to country. Ours will be different and still include Major League Soccer Cup playoffs, though with a smaller field. Promotion playoffs uh, would make up for lost MLS Cup matches. Number three, to piggyback on another um, message left, the way that Major League Soccer is covered is god-awful. It's covered like a daily sport, for example, Major League Baseball, NBA, NHL, but not as a weekly sport like the NFL. Anticipation and weekly coverage should be better. Shows like ESPN FC would be very appropriate to help hype. Major League Soccer's television coverage coverage needs an NFL-like structure where all games would be covered via ESPN Fox or a new partner and be broadcast regionally. Uh, through the main networks directly and not through regional sports networks. The sa- Saturday MLS Live matches need a better, more equal platform. Without that, Major League Soccer games are treated as though you can afford to miss a game here and there. And by the time the playoffs start, Major League Soccer becomes an afterthought. Schedule change would help big time with that. Promotion relegation would make more games uh, matter all year. It all ties together in the big picture. <coughs> And, and that's perfect timing too, Kartik, too. Yeah, uh, coming up in, in a few minutes, we're going to have our interview with uh, Carl Martino talking about all topics uh, related to his race, uh, including promotion and relegation. Now, listeners, if you do have any comments, questions, feedback, uh, let us know. We'd, we'd love to read those out on air. You can reach us through email. Uh, it's web at worldsoccertalk.com. 
Twitter. We've, we're now back on our main Twitter account. So after about a year of it being suspended, we're back in action. So it's now World Soccer Talk on Twitter. So a lot more easier to, to find us there. So tweet us at World Soccer Talk or facebook.com slash World Soccer Talk. Now, Kartik, let's move on to our featured topic of the week, our interview with Kyle Martino. Um, before we, we go ahead and, and start the discussion with Kyle, any, anything you want, you want to mention to preface uh, this interview? Yeah, obviously Kyle Martino has uh, dropped the bomb on the U.S. soccer presidential race this week, so I, I'm looking forward to talking about that with him, among other things. And Jonathan Gonzalez's decision to choose Mexico over the United States playing at every youth level for the United States uh, is another uh, big talking point. So uh, we're going to get his thoughts on both those things and in, in, in addition to uh, uh, some other uh, issues. Uh, and by the way, the bomb I, I'm saying Martino drop is related to Soccer United Marketing and their influence over uh, everything that happens at the U.S. men's national team and U.S. women's national team level. Okay, let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and kick off that interview with Carl Martino. Okay, everyone. So we're here with uh, Carl Martino, former U.S. men's national team and Major League Soccer uh, professional footballer, as well as NBC Sports analyst. Uh, Kyle, how are you? Uh, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm a little fatigued. I, it's kind of like uh, I've realized that mentally this is like running a marathon, but, but training for it by uh, just jumping in and running one instead of ramping up and starting with one mile, five miles, ten miles. So it's been an amazing and incredibly... Uh, interesting experience but I'm, I'm enjoying it yeah well we, we appreciate your time it's definitely uh, i'm sure a crazy time of the year we're missing you on the nbc sports uh, broadcast but uh, we totally understand oh, in terms of, uh, the opportunity here so i'll have kartik uh, kick things off in terms of uh, some of the questions we've got okay yeah Kyle, yeah thanks for taking the time to join us uh, next week is january 15th we know that was an important benchmark day for your campaign in terms of mm -hmm. uh, your general vision and proposals uh, regarding how you would reform the ussf if elected uh, uh is it too early to get a, a little bit of a sneak peek into what you're thinking and what we might see on the 15th no no not at all um yeah i mean that uh, the, the campaign so far, um, and first and foremost, just, just want to thank the other candidates for now that I've seen the, the, the sacrifice you need to make, the courage you need to uh, demonstrate to come into this, and, and just just the, the attrition, the, uh, the, the, the grind to make sure that not only are you out there getting to know voters, but you're out there understanding what fans want from this game and how we can fix it. And so uh, everyone's been bringing forward great ideas, but I think what we need from candidates now is to drill into these ideas and, and have them, uh, have each candidate demonstrate how they will execute and, and, and turning these ideas into actual either legislative procedures or, or t uh, you know, technical decisions that can grow a soccer culture and improve the quality of the players in this country and the interest we have in this beautiful game. So the, the summit I had in Manhattan in the beginning of December, um, it, it really it was born out of kind of the, the, the central message in my campaign, which is, of course, I have the three pillars of transparency, uh, equality, and progress, but I, if you were going to distill it down to one word, it's about humility. I think we need a leader at this point that uh, has experience, that understands the game, has courage to tackle problems, um, has has the wisdom to find the right people to help them to do so, but the humility to admit they're not the expert in all categories. So my summit was a diverse group of about 28 people, uh, most in person and a few on phone and video conference from all over the country and all across the soccer landscape. I mean, this is former you know World Cup winners and, and world class players, you know, and and administrators at the local level because everyone's important helping us at this inflection point, uh, grow as a soccer country. So uh, that progress plan I'm really excited about. It's almost finished. Uh, just putting some finishing touches on it. And I've been flying around the country, meeting with associations and other stakeholders, their input and ideas. And I've, and I've really fleshed out the, and you can't really call it a business plan until you get behind the curtain, but, but fleshed out the progress plan so that it, it, it really is a differentiator in terms of slogans and, and, and bumper sticker ideas 
and, and take it to how we actually run this thing and how I plan to govern. So uh, I'm more than willing to go into specifics, uh, but I'll, you know, I'm sure you have things that you'll ask about that can take us into the, the different aspects of my progress plan. Well, Great, and uh, we look forward to that release on, on the FQ. Yeah, one of the questions, Kyle, I have is in terms of this position as the U.S. soccer president, it seems that everything's falling apart at the seams. Uh, you, look, you look throughout the U.S. soccer structure, and yes, there's definitely positives, but it's a very challenging time, time for a, uh, whether it's a, a, a new USSF um, president to come into this. How much of, of a challenge do you see this, and, and, and do you see how much of a difference can you make and, and also, t talk to us more about the, the team that you have uh, behind you that are helping you with the campaign. I mean, how much how much confidence uh, do you have that you can make a, a huge difference? Yeah, good, um, good questions, Chris. So, um, you know, it, it, this is an overwhelming, uh, I mean, campaign for sure and process to get to February 10th. But but the, the the work is really going to become clear what a challenge this is once in office. The, the good part is I, I spend every day on the phone. Uh, with with a range of people that have either been volunteers or are now in paid positions to help us uh, grow this game and are doing it locally. And the Federation has shirked its member membership service responsibility. And what that's done, it's galvanized and empowered a lot of these people to help uh, to help us once we reconnect with them and integrate into their infrastructure instead of making decisions from from uh, from the soccer house in Chicago as, as edicts and mandates that we pass down. Uh, and, and then let the fight them fight over these things. Um, I, I'm so encouraged based on the conversations I've had and seeing the efficacy of that, that uh, summit I had in Manhattan that there is a desire for all of these different entities to come together. Um, you know, pay-to-play has become a buzzword, but, but I've spoken to a U.S. club, U.S. youth, AYSO, and, and say, and everyone uh, I was surprised to find out actually quarterly comes to the table already, they have best practices meetings. They're, they're discussing how they better define the space, how they create an actual pathway, because we all know there's incredible market confusion driving prices up and driving kids out of the game. So um, the biggest thing I'm going to have to do, Chris, and, and there is no one panacea, and there's no, there's no switch that's going to be flipped, and, I, and I, would be, I would be careful of believing in anyone that suggests that. Um, what needs to happen is, a, a reestablishing trust in the Federation. And, and I've already begun that, and, and I've quit my job, one that I love, uh, to, to go out and meet with these people and not start by telling them what I think and what needs to happen from my perspective, but asking their advice. And so I'm much more informed today uh, than I was yesterday, than I was a month ago or two months ago, and it's thanks to these people locally uh, that are, are the ones that understand what's going wrong and, and where, we're, where we're missing things. This isn't about missing a World Cup. It's about missing the big picture. And the big picture is if we don't focus on the local projects, grassroots initiatives to increase access into the game and improve retention, if we don't understand that you improve ratings by establishing an affinity for a team and a team right down the road for you, uh, if we don't do these things, you can pick Pep Guardiola to be your national team coach. You can pay him however much money, money you want. You can play in any stadium. You can have your jersey look like anything. None of that will matter and none of that will move the needle if we don't have a serious revamp structurally within U.S. soccer on how decisions are made technically. But most importantly, the Federation needs to sit at the bottom of the pyramid and prop this whole thing up instead of uh, being the most important part of it. I want to follow up on something you just uh, talked about, Kyle, because I think it's so important in my discussions with people around the game. The edicts coming from Soccer House and the crushing of local control and local autonomy. Uh, can you just give our listeners a few examples of, of yeah. what you've discovered in talking to people around the country in the last few months? Yeah, you know, there's this misconception that people hate mandates. They don't. You know, and, and I, the analogy I give is, when we were growing up, we didn't have a lot of money, and my parents would go out to dinner and leave my 14-year-old brother in charge of us. And it was like Lord of the Flies. We almost killed each other. Um, it, you know, it wasn't because we didn't love one another. It wasn't because we were bad kids. It was just because we needed guidance. And a lot of these associations, and I don't use that analogy to be pejorative and call them kids uh, and, and patronize, but they do want guidance. They want guidelines. They want coaching requirements. They want a lot of these things. 
they, they want a, a customized process so we understand that the game in California is different than Florida, is different than Maine, so you can't really make edicts that, that affect everyone equally. But, but they do want the federation to, to start guiding and leading and then regulating because then they'll, they'll create these edicts and then they won't enforce them, and that creates serious infighting competition. So I'll give you one example. Uh, we all know that we've made this game incredibly expensive, and it, it, it is not um, at a youth level as enjoyable as it used to be, and that's leading to massive exodus. I mean, 25% participation down. I mean, that's amazing from last year that we've lost 25% of participation. Now, all sports are losing uh, participation right now, but we're the only one in double digits. So we're getting something wrong. And what we're getting wrong, and Mia Hamm was the one that said this to me, there's an epidemic, and the game's not fun at the youth level anymore. And I'll, and I'll give you a part of the PDI. So the PDI, the Player to Form um, uh, uh, Development Initiative, was, was a you know 52 uh, slide presentation about how you professionalize the game, how do you how you create a pathway, and, and, and basically built off of how people are doing it in other countries. There's one slide. I think it's like the third or fourth. And it says that we, we need to stop treating our 12-year-olds like World Cup winners uh, and, and letting them enjoy the process. But then they created a rule based off of a birth chart that actually spits, splits up best friends at, at the youth level, at the recreational level, where it's about enjoyment and it's about playing with your friends and, 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 and smiling. And it's not about winning. It's just about health and wellness and playing this beautiful game. That one rule created an, a, an absolute stir. I mean, not to mention the first time they set the rule out, they had the wrong birth chart. It was embarrassing. But it just shows how out of touch the Federation is sometimes when they create these mandates. And the reason they're out of touch, they don't involve the local associations. They don't involve the U.S. youth and U.S. club and anyway. So they don't involve the people that can tell us what's going on on the ground in these communities in the decision process. So there's no discourse before these decisions. And, uh, you know, that's just one perfect example that encapsulates the, the discontent and disenfranchisement we're seeing with a lot of these people that we, we, we need uh, this is a country the size of Europe with the resources of, of, of you know, Westport, Connecticut. One of the big stories, uh, Kyle, to emerge this week was about uh, Jonathan Gonzalez uh, des- deciding to uh, select uh, L3 instead of uh, the U.S. men's yeah. national team. Now, emerging from that was the story in Soccer America where they uh, interviewed uh, Brad um, uh, Rothenberg, Allen's uh, son. Yeah. Uh, emerging from that was really kind of talking about um, really the lack of um, scouting, uh, spe- spe- particularly at the Allianz uh, showcases that they have uh, nationwide. Why would U.S. soccer, Major League Soccer, purposefully avoid sending scouts to these showcases when chances are there's some very good uh, Latino players here that are worth recruiting? Uh, you know, it, 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 it's a really troubling, troubling situation, and the timing of it's perfect. Not, not listen, just like failing to qualify for the World Cup, it's heartbreaking and and, and it's avoidable. And Jonathan choosing Mexico is heartbreaking and it's avoidable because he's an incredibly talented player that would improve our national team. Um, but, it, but it's emblematic of what we were just talking about. We don't focus on affordability, accessibility, and local initiatives and architecture, right? So we, 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 we don't see that as a priority. And I'll give you a, a for instance. We're paying still a coach we don't have, and we were paying him when he was our coach, Jurgen Klinsmann, $3 million a year and determined that he was underperforming. And by the way, that $3 million a year was, 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 was uh, multiples of what we were paying Bob Bradley for similar results. We, we have spent as a federation, this is something they bragged about in a, in a, in a um, presentation they put out recently. We've spent the same amount of money that we spent on one coach in one year and 10 years on financial aid. So we, we, we don't look into these communities. And I spent a lot of time on the phone the other day with Hugo Perez, who left the Federation for this very reason. We're not focusing on Latino communities, inner city initiatives, and, and understanding that how you solve the problem of not being able to do what Germany did, right? Everyone wants to cite DOS Reboot, but forget the fact that they're already World Cup winners. It's the number one sport, and they spent $2 billion on the project, and they're the size of Oklahoma. So 
they, they had 1,200 full, full-time, part-time coaches and scouts. They have 390 centers of excellence. You know, $150 million surplus doesn't get us there. But, but what gets us there is, is, is trusting in a network we can create through technology and through, and, and, and through empowering regional uh, managers, empowering regional scouts, and, and professionalizing and formalizing the relationship with local scouts. I mean, that's how they do it abroad, is you don't try to cover the, the, the country the size of Europe with, with nine scouts and, and hope everyone makes it into these ID camps or makes it into these, uh, you know, training days. That, that's not going to work. You know, only, only half of the states even have academies, right? So in, in order to make sure that Jonathan Gonzalez is identified, um, you have a scouting issue that we need to solve. But listen, Jonathan, Jonathan Gonzalez was identified. That's not the problem. We knew he was there. Everyone knew he was there. Just like Subotic, we knew he had quality, and we knew it was a player that we should go after. But the affinity wasn't there for Jonathan Gonzalez because he didn't even get a phone call. So everyone right now is so caught up in World Cup bids and elections in the top of the pyramid. No one within U.S. soccer lobbed this talented player a call and said, we want you to represent our country. We need you. And, and that, that was something that he said in his announcement. If it would have came, it would have made it a harder decision for him. Um, but, but it starts much, much earlier. Jonathan Gonzalez, when he's a little kid, needs to feel an affinity for the crest. He needs to feel being a member of this organization. It, it means something. And we offer to Latino communities the exact same commensurate opportunity and, and involvement that we do to the rich kids that, that are able to make it up the pyramid. So uh, it, it really starts at the youth level. And I'll give you one, for instance, how I never had a Spanish speaking coach my whole career. I mean, it's just impossible for that to happen, but also we don't have a U.S. soccer um, social media feed that's in Spanish. So, so there's so many examples of, we, we just turn our backs on one of the largest parts of our community that's, filled with and, and bursting at the seams with incredible talent and they just don't feel the affinity for for our team and I, I i'm i'm upset with guys like tab i love tab he was one of my heroes growing up he's a friend of mine and, and i'm glad he's involved with u.s soccer because he has a lot of quality and he's a great coach but his comment the other day saying if you don't want to play for you know if you don't feel it in your heart to play for us and i'm paraphrasing you know go play for another country you know d- dual nationals and I'm one. I'm an Italian citizen and American citizen. You're, you, you know, you are split, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. But, but we can't blame this on Jonathan. It's not his fault. This is our fault. We got it wrong, and we're the ones to blame. So I refuse to blame dual nationals for, for wanting to play for other countries because Mexico did a better job scouting a player in our backyard than we did. Earlier this week, you made some serious allegations about Soccer United marketing to the USSF Athlete Council uh, in your written interview, and specifically that there's stakeholders in Soccer United, uh, excuse me, stakeholders, equity stakeholders in Soccer United marketing that also are on the USSF board are involved in, in contracts. And I think that there's a very messy uh, situation here in terms of lack of RSPs, lack of transparency, all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, are you uh, in the position to elaborate further on on what specifically you were talking about, or at least give us some um, some clarity as to it. Yeah, thanks for offering me that because um, it did create a buzz. And, and listen, I, I I knew that it was going to create um, the, the hysteria that it did, and that's not why I did it. Um, you know, I, the compliment, and I'm appreciative. Thank you, Chris, for that compliment about NBC and the work we do. I, I'm the only American voice on the Premier League, not because I played in the Premier League or I was some phenomenal player. Um, just because I've established a credible uh, reputation, and I'm not salacious, I'm not looking for sound bites. And, and the last time I did something like this was actually a, a, a U.S. soccer situation. When I was on set at RFK at halftime of a Major League Soccer game, and I was very critical of Martin Vasquez. And so that situation is similar to this one in, in a few ways. Uh, I had heard from several people that were knowledgeable there was a situation going on where Martine wasn't executing and was put in a position as a number two uh, to have too much pressure and, and was not of the level of a Yogi Love or someone that could handle that and, and create a game plan for a weekend and execute it during the week. So I'd heard that, but that's not enough. It's not good journalism just to, to take some, a, a few players' comments and then go to the press. So I went and observed, and I watched several training days and several training camps and realized that they were right. 
And right when Jurgen was hired, um, we all knew that Yogi Love was, was a big part of what was successful about that. So, so this is not groundbreaking, but I went on the set, and I, and I was critical of Martin Vasquez, saying he was not, uh, he was not executing and, and was not, I think, qualified for what was being asked for him, of him. And the day, uh, that night, when I got off the set, I got a call from U.S. Soccer, and they wanted me to talk to Jurgen, and Jurgen got on the phone with me. And this is days before a qualifier at the Aztec against Mexico. So it was already really troubling to me that they thought it was important enough leading up to such a huge game uh, to chastise me. And, and Jurgen was really upset that I said that and basically told me don't do that anymore. And then I got banned from press meetings coming up. And, and I wasn't allowed to have access, as other members of the media were, to players and coaches. And uh, NBC put their foot down and said, well, we're not going to cover anything anymore if you do that, because Kyle did this in an ethical way. He's a fantastic uh, uh, pundit, and, and he operated within very uh, strict guidelines we have for, for, op- for, for, for covering soccer and, and making these comments in the right way. And they immediately reversed their decision. And then what happened a few months later, uh, Martin Vasquez was fired uh, and replaced right before the World Cup, which was a shocking decision. Now, I don't believe for a second it was because of me, and we should all hope it wasn't because of me, because that's even scarier. But, but I was right then. And listen, the, 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 the Red Bull Arena Stadium situation, I, I realize that's a very delicate scenario. And I realize I come from a different vantage point of playing in World Cup qualifiers you know, and going to Saprissa Stadium and walking through riot police as rocks were being thrown and sitting in that locker room with plaster hitting us on the head because the fans were jumping so high and, and loud and, and strong and then walking out to a stadium where we sat there for our national anthem and they booed during it and, and playing in World Cup qualifiers where to, to the millimeter they figure out what they want the grass to look like to make it hard for us. So that's where I come from when I'm talking about competition and having a competitive advantage. So and instead of getting into the, the weeds of the arrangement, here's what I have to say. Really what I wanted to point to and lend my credibility towards, uh, and that's what I'm able to do is, listen, if, if I'm absolutely dead wrong, then, then, I, then I've lost a tiny bit of credibility, but it was, it was for the better of this game because I cashed it in to get transparency that doesn't exist. So the biggest problem I was trying to point out is um, – if, if the arrangement between MLS sum and U.S. soccer, and let me just say, an arrangement that at its creation was a very smart idea that saved Major League Soccer, that has been incredibly beneficial to the growth of so many things in this game, um, but, but with how opaque that, that, that relationship is and the conflicts of interest that, if only perceived, are seriously corrosive and detrimental to the brand of soccer in this country. The fact that no answers have ever come forward to help assuage our concerns that there are diminishing returns to that relationship, well, I, I decided I would lend my credibility to get some answers. And it wasn't a shot in the dark. Bruce Arena was someone who was willing to, and others weren't, be on record to, to allow me to say I spoke with them. And in U.S. Soccer's comments about that game, they say they consult coaches. They consult coaches directly to ask them about decisions for a fact that Bruce Arena said we can't play there. And listen, Bruce Arena has more World Cup qualifying experience than anyone in this country. He said we can't play there. It's the worst possible place for us to play this game. I want to move it. And they said no. So they didn't listen to Bruce then. And then don't tell me that if you're consulting national team coaches, the coaches of the women's teams want to play on turf. I promise you they don't. So they're not listening to those coaches. So it really what I wanted to highlight is two things. How are these decisions being made? Who's making them? And why are they making the decisions that I think are, are, are not prioritizing competitive advantage? Um, and, and I really think it's hard to debunk that. The, 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 there, there are decisions that are not made in the, in the interest and priority of competitive advantage in World Cup qualifiers. Friendly is a totally different uh, picture. So that's one piece of this. Um, I, I'm, I'm basically creating a binary situation where it's either incompetence, we're making bad decisions because the right people are making them, or we're not listening to people, or it's because there's a relationship that is, that is so muddled and, and hard to understand and has never been explained to us that, that is, is, is overlapping the decision makers because Sunil and Don sit on the U.S. soccer board, and they, they were part of the creation and, found, and founding of some. 
So again, I give them so much credit for that because that was the right thing to do. And it was great that they did it. It was a very good strategic move. But if there's still overlap, and no one's, no one's told us that there isn't, if there's still overlap, then, then saying that U.S. soccer unilaterally makes these decisions, it, it's kind of it's a distinction without a difference if, if there are still people that sit on multiple boards and have multiple benefits to these decisions. So I, I, I don't have definitive proof of these things. I just have people that have been in these rooms and have been a part of these decisions and these discussions. But what we all have is, is, is zero understanding of how this relationship works, and we have to get answers to that. They owe us answers. And if the answer is, Kyle, you're wrong, this is unfounded, I, I, I actually would prefer that because even if my credibility took a hit, we would finally understand what this relationship is, and no one can give you a straight answer. Now, speaking of some and U.S. soccer, would you – be in favor of not renewing the sum contract uh, when it comes up for uh, when it expires in 2020? Well, for, first off, um, I'm taking conflict of interest very, very seriously. I, I've hired an estate planning firm to create an LLC. I have an accountant running my, my, uh, my funding. So every dollar that's spent, every penny that's spent that comes in and goes out is accounted for. Um, I've quit my job with NBC at great financial cost, but it's fine. There are many volunteers in this game. Uh, I'm, I'm willing to walk away from my ownership in Mallorca, uh, another dream of mine. And I'm, I'm doing it all because transparency is essential. Um, but so I'm running on, on a, a, a platform where I talk about decisions being made democratically with a diverse group. So I will never have the authority to make any of these decisions unilaterally, and no one should. But, but if some is as beneficial as Kathy and, 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 Neil and Don are telling us, then that's great. But we need an open bidding process because this is a third party that's owned by MLS owners that has never been bid out. So uh, IMG and other groups that do this, I thought Kathy um, gave an explanation in her Athletes Council answers that um, it, it is, it's, it's not a good one to, to compare it to the NCAA and IMG and say that you know third party organizations like she's absolutely right. And it was really good to make this distinction. They, they, the reason that people don't do it internally is they mitigate risks. So they underwrite a lot of losses and they give guarantees up front so that if you fail to qualify for a World Cup or don't get the attendance you wanted and, and, and all of these different variables that create risk for putting your own money towards these projects or running yourself, um, third-party organizations like some are great for that. Uh, but if we've never bid it out, and, and we've never showed the details of this arrangement, then it's hard to know if it's still beneficial or if we're in diminishing returns. What once was an amazing relationship, is it still amazing? So we won't know these things until they at least tell us, or we won't know these things until I'm behind the curtain. So it's hard to answer that question, Chris. I'll tell you that if some is the best, if some offers us the best contract, if some does their job and, and their services better than other organizations, well, then in an open bidding process, they'll win the bid. But, but we're not going to do the, 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 the closed-door uh, Byzantine and, and, and opaque ways of, of creating these deals. It's not going to happen anymore. It can't. For the health of our organization, we must champion. In a climate of corruption, we're right down the street from these offices. Uh, FIFA members are being, and, and CONCACAF members are being arrested for bribes and, and other, uh, other issues with how FIFA was run before uh, the, the recent presidential change there, we, sh we should be the ones championing, championing the, the idea of transparency for every federation, to hold everyone to a high standard of saying how you do business. Last question for me. Um, I know you've got a busy schedule, so I don't want to hold you for much uh, longer. Uh, but this is dear and dear to our listeners, uh, Kyle. Uh, you're uh, a superstar on NBC. We miss you on the Premier League broadcast. Uh, obviously, Fox and ESPN before that. How has broadcasting this sport and uh, from, from uh, developing uh, relationships through a, as a broadcaster, from understanding the world of football and soccer around you as a broadcaster and uh, appreciating different, different perspectives on the sport uh, from being a broadcaster, how has all of that helped, you, helped prepare you for this candidacy and ultimately the job of president? Yeah, good question. I mean, one is I've been given that role and that honor because I'm an analyst of the game. So I think it's really beneficial to have a president that can see the game like I can uh, and not want to be the technical director and make the unilateral decisions, but offer that experience and, 
and an advisory board that's going to sit underneath me and a technical director that will help us educate our board to make good decisions. It's great to have a president that can do that. Um, but, but, you know, there's this, this idea that I'm not a business person, right? And uh, I worked in finance. I'm on the ownership group of a 100-year-old club in Spain. I'm already running a soccer business right now with, with a group. So um, media is the biggest part of your revenue. Media should be the biggest vertical, and it's one of the reasons the Premier League is the, the, the most watched and, and strongest professional leagues in the world because of their strong uh, revenue stream from radio deals. So having relationships with Fox all the way up at the top, NBC all the way up at the top, and ESPN all the way up at the top, uh, and, and recently I had a meeting with John Skipper before his announcement, and as a close friend and someone who I respect so much uh, for, for really being a vanguard in the space where other networks weren't really putting money towards the game, he was. And, and I wish him health and, and getting over the struggles he's dealing with. I, I, have, I have the relationships that get me meetings and strategic discussions with, our, with our, our partners who will help us grow those verticals and really start to move the needle in terms of developing a product that's compelling and, and commensurate with other leagues around the world, but, but also a differentiation from other sports in our in our market that have a bigger market share and have been in the game longer than we have. So understanding the nuances of the challenges they have with cord cutting and how people are consuming the game in a different way, understanding what the, what the interest would be and, and how it would affect them if we opened the system and would they be willing to bid and how would that change their, their rights decisions and money and investment towards their, their rights deals, understanding all those nuances, but most importantly, having trust and having relationships all the way up to the decision makers is essential for a president that's going to try to grow soccer in this, in this culture. And then, and then lastly, it has to be a full-time position, you know, for, for myriad reasons. But one, I know who Roger Goodell is. I know who Adam Silver are, not because I watch their sports a lot, but because they're in my phone or they're on my radio and they're on my TV selling us this sport. We, we need, we need a, a president that's not uh, reclusive and not behind the scenes. We need a president that can go out there and be on the Today Show, be on, on uh, you know, Bill Maher, be on, on, on uh, anything, and, and, and talking on morning and late night TV about why we have the greatest game on the planet and why at this point where CTE is taking, uh, well, I mean, we saw what Brett Favre the other day said. He wouldn't let his grandkids play football. And, and parents are really worried about participation in that sport. I mean, there's an opportunity right now to, to, to sell our game, and, and it's the easiest sell to make, as the number one game on the planet, and tell people why that is and why their kids should be involved for life. And, and we need a president that's out there doing it all the time. Last question, uh, Kyle, is that if you were president of USSF today, what would you do to resolve the NESL antitrust lawsuit against um, the USSF and the whole question about uh, the D2 or D3 accreditation for NESL? Yeah, good, good question. I've talked to Rishi and I've talked to Don and I've talked to everyone. So I, I know enough to be dangerous, but I don't know enough to, to be able to be definitive um, because there, there, there are aspects uh, that are protected in this lawsuit, like any lawsuit, from me really – uh, being able to to make a comment from from a, a strong uh, from a strong position of of edification and knowing uh, what's what's behind a lot of the issues. Now I'll tell you this: the fact that uh, the the lawsuit exists is a bad thing, and, and right there we should not have our 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 stakeholders and and our. Um, are what I thought were collaborators. We shouldn't have them fighting each other like this. And you know, this is in the youth level. This is in the professional level. There are a lot of there are a lot of uh, issues like this where we're competing with each other when we should be pulling in the same direction. So what what I will continue to do is is uh, educate myself on why it's gotten to this point and what can be done to unravel it and what can be done to help strengthen the NASL. Uh, we want that league to stick around. We want professional leagues to thrive and flourish because that. That's how you get into every market in this country, not through expansion with one professional league, but the strength of all professional leagues. So one thing I would immediately do is, is, is see if uh, we are close to any sort of sell settlement to, to, to at least park litigation uh, and, and table it and, and, and come forward. And, and from what I've heard, we were close to a few settlements. 
and for for myriad reasons, it it, it didn't happen. You know, I, I would just ask people to to put their lawyers away and come back to the table in, in a collaborative way and in a, in a unemotional way and begin talking about what we all want together and see if that leads us uh, in, in terms of mediation towards a solution. If it doesn't, then yeah, it's going to have to go back to seeing if there's a legal basis for for both arguments. And uh, you know, that's above my pay grade, and I, I just. Uh, all I can say is that at pres- as president, I, I want to resolve issues like this. I don't. I don't want our our uh, our, our strategic partners fighting. Excellent. Well, Carl Martino, thank you so much for being on the uh, podcast. We really appreciate your time, and uh, best of luck in the election. Yeah, well, thanks a lot, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, Kartik. So, uh, where can listeners find you on the internet if they want to find out your latest posts or interviews or uh, thoughts and analysis? You can find me on the internet at uh, KKFLA737 on Twitter. That's the easiest place. And then uh, worldsoccertalk.com, uh, uh, the website. And obviously now uh, we have our old Twitter handle back, as uh, you mentioned earlier in the show. World Soccer Talk is our Twitter handle now. Yep, and that's where you can find me. So if you have any questions or uh, hate mail for me, send it there. So thank you, everyone, for listening. You can get a new episode of the World Soccer Talk podcast every Thursday. Every episode is released on SoundCloud, YouTube, Stitcher, iTunes, Tune in, Audio Boom, and WorldSoccerTalk.com. And Kartik, looking ahead to this uh, weekend of football, what should they do? Enjoy your football. <laughs> <laughs>